Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, they gave me the toughest assignment of the conference. It's, uh, I'm the only one standing between you and cocktail hour downstairs. <laughs> and so uh, I expect some of you to start seceding from the room uh, before I'm finished. <laughs> I notice a couple of you have flasks in your jacket. I can, I can spot them, the big bulge in your jacket uh, out there. And, uh, so uh, my talk, the topic I gave was how human action influenced uh, my teaching and research career. I was a university economics professor for uh, 41 years. I, I still can't believe it when I say that. I finished my, uh, my PhD when I was 24 at, um, at Virginia Polytechnic Institute. As soon as they got a better football team with guys like Michael Vick, they changed the name to Virginia Tech. So, but it's, they used to be VPI. So I went to school. But where I first discovered uh, Austrian economics was my first semester in college uh, when I took a principle of, uh, principles of economics class. Uh, it was like a miracle to me that there was a bookshelf in the classroom and it had all the back issues of the Freeman magazine in it. One of, the, one of my, prof my favorite professors, turned out to be my favorite economics professor, was a Chicago school guy. And so I started flipping through the old Freeman, and uh, you know, I was 18 years old, and I, started, I was reading uh, Milton, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, uh, William H. Hutt, uh, Israel Kersner, and all these old Freeman articles. Uh, and so for the whole four years of college, I was, I was reading the Freeman, and, uh, and it, was, you know, it was the level of the Freeman. It was the, the, the level of it. And uh, my, this professor of mine also uh, got, uh, knew about the early public choice literature, and he got me interested in public choice, and I, I, th I thought it was really interesting. Um, and so I ended up going to graduate school at uh, VPI, and because that's where James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock were there. Were there. Randy Holcomb this morning, uh, he was a couple of years before me at, uh, at VPI. And, uh, and so I, and in my first semester in uh, there, uh, in the graduate program, uh, the microeconomics class had two books assigned and, uh, and a big long reading list. And the first book was this one, Human Action. And the second book was Price Theory by Milton Friedman. This is the actual book. I've had this for 48 years, and dragging it around uh, somewhere uh, with my name. And so, uh, and one of the final exam questions was to compare the uh, the economic methodologies uh, in human action compared to price theory, Friedman's price theory. And when the, when the game theorists in the economics department got wind of that, they blew a gasket. They thought, you, you don't ask questions like that uh, in graduate school. That's, and you, 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 you put hundreds of equations on the blackboard. That's what you do in, 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 in graduate school. And so in the time that I have, I'm going to just make some comments about how what impressed one of the things that really impressed me was the, uh, the chapter on the market. Um, and, and, if you, you know, and I, and I, I assigned this chapter for decades to my students to, to read about. You know, if you want to understand how the market works, read human action, at least parts of human action. And, and if you look at just what the things, uh, topics covered in this one chapter uh, on the market in human action. Uh, and I'm going to compare this to the next book that I use in the second semester, uh, uh, the mainstream book. Uh, the Invisible Hand Theorem is explained. Uh, you know, that's, that's where you start. Mark the mutual cooperation in markets. Yeah, it's all about the mutual cooperation of markets, the role of prices. And I'm saying these things because if you look at some of the mainstream economics books, even of my time, um, it's hard to find these explanations. So I've had a, I had a colleague who got his PhD at Purdue, and he said the first two years are pure mathematics. He said he didn't really hear, hear he said, I don't think I heard the word prices until the third year of the program at Purdue. <laughs> and if you, if you, he was probably exaggerating, but not, but not by too much. There's no such thing as a mixed economy, Mises said in this chapter. And, and this has been covered in earlier speeches today, even with uh, sort of socialistic uh, bureaucracies in the city government and all that. We still have a market economy for the most part. You learned all about the importance of capital as a starting point of economic calculation it, and the whole story of income savings and a cap, capital accumulation, the importance of cap, capital accumulation for economic growth and prosperity. You had the whole analysis of socialism in this one chapter also. Uh, 
you learn that economics is a theory of all human action. It's not just how to organize inputs in the production process or how consumers maximize their satisfaction. It's about the world. It's a, it's, it's, it can be about everything. Uh, Gary Becker, the, old, the, uh, the late Gary Becker, the famous Chicago School Nobel laureate, was famous for writing books on economics of the family, uh, you know, e uh, things like economics of discrimination, thing, uh, applying economics to topics that were usually you think of as in a sociology class or a political science class. But Mises made this point, too, in, in, in human action. Uh, consumer sovereignty, the great quotes, uh, I think somebody already meant, might have been Peter that mentioned this great quote by Mises about how it's really the, uh, the consumer that's in charge. You, you see the bankers and the business people and, and, and all of them, they appear to be in charge of production, but it's really the consumer. That's one of my favorite quotes from, from Human Action because it gets kind of nasty. He, he pretty much says, they don't give a crap. Uh, the consumers, we the consumers, don't give a crap about you and your, you and your your company. <laughs> if somebody offers me a better deal tomorrow, you're you're toast. Your history. Yeah, that, those are my words. That's, Mises was much more eloquent, but I, I always love that. I always love that. It reminded me of what Thomas Sowell once once said uh, he, when he taught at UCLA. He uh, he used the Wealth of Nations in one of his classes. He taught history of thought, and he told his students on the first day of class. If you can find one comment that Adam Smith makes that is favorable to business people, you get an A in the class and you don't have to come to class anymore. <laughs> because they, you know, because the impression most people have, it's a defense of capitalists, you know, the wealth of nations. But, and and this, this passage by um, Mises reminded me of that. Government is all about compulsion and coercion. You learn that in, ch in this chapter, too. Catalactic competition. That was a very, very impressive to me because I, early in my career, I, I published a lot in the area of antitrust economics, and uh, and, and and understand and, and the whole the whole Austrian theory of competition. I taught that class at Mises University for about twenty years or so, and as far as that goes. But that's where where I first started learning about uh, catalactic competition, the role of freedom. And the role of freedom, you know, I doubt that uh, the, any mainstream uh, uh, microeconomics course at any other university would use a book that would talk about freedom, <laughs> believe, believe it or not. And here's another one of my favorite quotes uh, from Mises in this chapter. In the, to in the totalitarian countries, you have the freedom to commit suicide. That's the, <laughs> the, only, the only kind of freedom you have is the freedom to commit suicide. And m my old friend, the late uh, Yuri Maltsev, told me many, many stories about how his young friends, uh, by the time they were in their 40s, were dead from alcoholism because they saw no future. And the only thing that made them happy was drinking. So they drank themselves to death at an early age. And then that was the only freedom they had. And they had the freedom to drink. Uh, at one point, it had to be uh, airplane de-icing fluid and things like that in the Soviet Union. But, uh, but yeah, that was very true. Yuri told me stories about that, too. Uh, the virtues of inequality of wealth. How about that? Okay. I hope no, see, this is a, a unique audience. No one gasped <laughs> in, in this audience. The virtues of the inequality of wealth and, and of merit. Oh, my God, merit. Uh, entrepreneurship. There, there are 11 dense, very dense pages on entrepreneurship here. And of course, all throughout the book, there's discussions of the entrepreneur. But in this chapter, this is the chapter that starts that it starts uh, a real serious, in-depth discussion of, of entrepreneurship. You don't get that anywhere. Even to this day, all the, the textbooks in microeconomics uh, have just a tiny bit on, uh, on entrepreneurship. Pro you learn profit management versus bureaucratic management. You know, Mises wrote this book on uh, on bureaucracy, a really early book on bureaucracy, before anybody in the public choice movement wrote a book on bureaucracy. Their big book, their big classic book is uh, by William Niskanen, but that was published probably 20 years after uh, Mises wrote, more than 20 years, 25 years after after Mises wrote his book on, on bureaucracy, based on this, based on partly based on this, this chapter, and free trade and protectionism. So that's all just one chapter. All of that, all of that in, in uh, in, in just one chapter of the book, this chapter five. Now, <clears throat> and, and 
since I only have a half hour, I can't mention more than that about what I, my initial experience with human action. But it, the, the class was taught by Richard Wagner, who uh, I guess is emeritus now, George Mason. He moved to George Mason when, when Jim Buchanan and Gordon Tulloch and the Public Choice Center moved in the 1980s when I was there. I was on the faculty when they moved. So these are my professors in graduate school, and they all came to George Mason when I was working there. And naturally, I told everybody that, that I was the reason they came there. <laughs> that they, moved, they left VPI and went to George, to George Mason. And, uh, and, uh, but anyway, but then the next semester, the textbook, you had three, three semesters of microeconomics and, and macroeconomics and econometrics and math econ and all that stuff. And so the, uh, the second semester book was uh, Henderson and Quant, Microeconomic Theory, a Mathematical Approach. And it was a typical mainstream book of the time. And I was just talking to Connor, and when, when he was in graduate school, he used this, this book by a guy named Hal Varian. But this was sort of a precursor that any of you who went to graduate school in economics may have run across these books. But this was one of the early mathematical microeconomics uh, books. And it was kind of like the, um, every, every page was like the, what uh, Peter put on the, on the screen a little bit ago, a lot of big blur of differential equations and, you know, and, every, and the plow through on every, every page. And I'm gonna, I have some bullet points of some of the things that they tried to teach. You know, they would make a statement like this, and then you'd have another 15 or 20 pages of equations to, to prove that statement. And the first one is the basic problem of the book. You know, this is in like in the introduction. The basic problem of this book is, quote, teaching economics in mathematical terms. And that, that, always, that always struck me as odd, is that, well, if you already know math economics, why do you need to translate it into mathematics? So I went, why is that necessary? And, and, and my math econ professor, uh, during that same semester, we happened to be in a classroom uh, where the previous class was an English class. This was at Virginia Tech. Uh, it was actually Pamplin Hall where all the shootings happened uh, a few years ago. And there was a poem on the blackboard. And, uh, and he wanted to ingrain in us that you should never say anything in English that you could say in, in, the, in some sort of mathematical language. And so he gets on the board and he starts trying to, pretending to translate this in mathematical set theory. And, he's, and, and, and he was serious about that. He was, it was the lesson of the day. Okay, and that's, that's the introductory chapter. The entrepreneur, here's the one thing I could find in this book. Uh, last week I looked this up. Uh, on the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is owner and manager who transforms inputs into outputs. That's it. That's it, you'll find. <laughs> There's nothing else, nothing else. Owner, and it's not even correct, I mean, owner and manager. Yeah, man. the, 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 you know, the, uh, the, no separation of ownership from control, uh, discussion or anything like that, uh, you know, stockholders and all the owner and manager. Okay, competition. What does competition mean? Well, here's the definition of competition. Homogeneous commodities, consumers are all identical, numerous firms and consumers, perfect information by firms and consumers, costless entry and exit. Those are the famous assumptions of the perfect competition model. And that, that was how, for decades, the economics profession committed the, uh, what, what Harold Dempsey's called the nirvana fallacy. They hold, this is what a perfect competition is, and I used to call it aha enom, economics. And they would look at, they would say, here's a perfect competition, and then they would, they would say basically, aha, the world is not like that. We, we need regulation, taxation, subsidies, government, bureaucracy to, to, to change the world so that it's like that. And the markets fail. And of course, markets always fail if you compare them to, to nirvana or utopia. There's no such thing as utopia and Havana. And, and, and so that, that created endless uh, uh, misinformation in the minds of generations of students to think that the competition has anything to do with that. Friedrich Hayek famously wrote in his, uh, his book on, uh, comp his essay on competition in his book, Individualism and Economic Order, that in he said, in perfect competition, there is no competition which is true, but that's what um, the students of the day and st still some today were taught uh, about, about that. Factor markets are the same thing, the chapter on factor markets, homogeneous inputs. Inputs are, 
cap, there's one kind of capital, it's called K. That's capital, you know, everything's homogeneous. And, and so you just ignore, re- on purpose, you ignore reality. And, and that's, the, that's the one thing that really struck me about the Austrians when I first started reading Human Action, is that uh, von Mises was obsessed with understanding how the world works, whereas the, the mainstream economists were obsessed with impressing their colleagues with how much math they thought they knew, how, how their models worked, how models worked. And this is a true story. The, the economics department at VPI, James Buchanan was pretty much ran the show. Uh, they brought in a Princeton uh, economist uh, professor to, uh, who presented a seminar uh, where he filled up several blackboards. Back in those days, everything was on the blackboards with, with chalk, and the uh, seminar was mostly somebody would show up and, and they, would, they would spend about 10 or 15 minutes writing equations on the board, and then they would get confused <laughs> and then lost. And on top of that, on the faculty was David Friedman, Milton Friedman's son, who had a doctorate in physics. And so all of these guys who were sort of half-baked mathematicians would come up and they, they'd, they'd get, after the 15 minutes, they would get lost. And David Friedman would, would be like a pit bull on, you know, after them. He would not give up so much so that uh, Buchanan had to have a talk with him and tell him to shut up eventually because <laughs> no seminar would ever end. It just, it did David Friedman and this guy would be arguing <laughs> over this. Over this. Uh, so it was kind of funny. And so, uh, but anyway, this Princeton professor, he put, he did his thing, and he didn't make any mistakes. He was a Princeton mathematician, and uh, and uh, when it was all over, um, my, my professor Gordon Tullock, you know, I was I was his research assistant, uh, uh, Gordon's, and uh, he says, but uh, this doesn't look anything like the hamburger market, and uh, this and this guy says uh, it, it was Professor Ung, N G was how he spelled his name. And Professor Ung said, I'm not interested in the, ha- the real hamburger market. I'm interested in my model. And, uh, <laughs> and so, and so, and so uh, I was sitting in the, in the back in the peanut gallery with the other graduate students. I remember we were drawing graphs with hamburgers in the middle and hot dogs and <laughs> things like that. But, but that, that was a lesson to me that that's what the a mainstream Princeton, you know, the endowed shareholder, that's what they do. That's the, that's the model, okay. Another thing, uh, another statement from Henderson and Quant, uh, quote, monopolistic elements that exist will preclude the possibility of a Pareto optimal allocation, an efficient allocation of resources. Therefore, appropriate subsidizing and taxing is necessary. So in monopolistic elements mean anything that diverges from that perfect competition definition. So anything that diverges, diverges from utopia is a monopolistic uh, uh, element. And, and so th- that's the, the nirvana fallacy on, fair, on steroids. And since they mentioned, they mentioned taxing and uh, subsidizing may be necessary, it called into mind a famous essay in, in the Journal of Law and Economics by Stephen Chung. He was a professor at the University of Washington called The Fable of the Bees. And, uh, and, for, and for decades in the, in the economics textbooks, uh, the example they gave of in, in the externalities chapter would be uh, an apple orchard located next to a beekeeper. Uh, and, uh, and, and, they are, and the problem was uh, the beekeeper didn't have enough incentive to, to, to get the bees close enough to the apple orchard to pollinate the apple orchard because there's a, a big benefit to the, the orchard owner to do that. And apparently the orchard owners were too dumb to, to figure out that, well, maybe I could pay the beekeeper a few bucks and he could move his bees closer so that they could pollinate you know, my, my trees and it would be good for everybody. And that, that was seen, uh, that, and that, that was used by Paul Samuelson and, and, other, and several other Nobel Prize winning economists in their, in their textbooks as market failure because there's sort of a, and, and they called for subsidies for beekeepers among other things, to do that. And, but Stephen Chung, who lived in Washington State, uh, where they grow a lot of apples, he did something that most, very few economics professors ever do. He got up off his swivel chair and went out in the world and researched the apple orchard business. And, he, and lo and behold, he found contract after contract after contract between beekeepers and apple orchard owners to, do, <laughs> to solve this problem. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't need some professor to tell them how to make money. 
you know, it would be like uh, the, 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 the orchard owner is, is walking around and there's like a pile of gold bars there. Oh, gold bars, and just, <laughs> just keep on walking. I, I'm not gonna bend over to pick up the gold bars. And so, uh, so that's another statement in this book, a social welfare function, and uh, I don't know if everybody knows what a social welfare function is, but uh, I'm not gonna explain it here. States, societies, and then get this, in parentheses, this is in a textbook, or a dictator's preferences. And, and the objective of uh, welfare economics is to maximize this social welfare f function. And so uh, that's, that's mainstream economics. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna mention, it says about interest. What is interest? An interest rate expresses the cost of borrowing or income from lending. That's it, that's what they did. That's no talk of time preference or anything like that. And, and that's what, in my day, that's what, uh, if you went to graduate school at, at most universities in America and you took microeconomics, Henderson and Quant was the Samuelson of graduate school microeconomics at that, in the 1970s. I mean, that's, when the, that's when this period was, probably in, into the 80s. And so, so comparing that to human action, Mises was a, a giant model of scholarship to me. I, I read, when I read human action in graduate school, that uh, you know this, you know the Austrians. That if if he if this is what Austrian economics was about, he had he invoked not just economic theory, uh, psychology, philosophy, political philosophy, political economy, critiques of the appropriate use of mathematics and, and economics and, and all that. And so the the mathematical economists to me when I was in graduate school they seemed like the mental midgets to, compared to the Austrians. <laughs> And I'm sorry about that. I mean, uh, size-challenged persons. I should have said that instead of, instead of uh, mental mental midgets. That's not, that's not good. And so, uh, uh, human action was a gateway drug for me because I, I said, well, what other Austrians are there? You know, we, we read this, and 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 Dick Wagner had other other people. Uh, he brought in Ludwig Lachmann uh, to VPI, and so I, I met Ludwig Lachmann. And, and Murray Rothbard uh, in his lecture series, and uh, and then and but that was that one year, and then they kicked. Uh, they had a big fight with the game theorists and the mathematical mathematical, mathematical economists, and Dick never taught micro again. So that was uh, so the one, it was the one year that I was starting the program was the one year they did this, and, and Buchanan wanted him to do this. Buchanan is the one who got him to use human action. And, and Gordon Tullock, who I was working for, I was his research assistant at the time, my first year in graduate school, he was writing a textbook with Richard McKenzie. Uh, he always claimed that uh, uh, he, that's what made him an economist, reading you. His degree was a law degree from Chicago. He never had an economics degree. And when, when Buchanan won the Nobel Prize, I, asked, I, I called Gordon. I was, I was at Washington University in St. Louis at the time. And I said, uh, Gordon, why didn't you be the co-winner of the Nobel Prize. And he said they decided I wasn't enough of, of an economist. And uh, I would argue he was more of an economist. He read Human Action, he, that's how he became an economist. But that's, that's what he told me, okay? And so, and so uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna run out of time before too long, but, uh, but reading Human Action, maybe you wanna uh, go and, and read uh, other literature. And uh, Randy Holcomb mentioned uh, this morning that when he was there, He's much older than me. He could grave, he has a white beard and all that. But uh, it was just a couple of years, but there were a, a bunch of students who knew about the Austrian school and they taught him, they gave him, and some of them were still around. Some of them were still around. Some of the third and fourth year students would come back and, and, and we would talk to them. And so I got, through them, I got to learn about Hayek and, and Kersner and some of the other Austrians over the years. And so a bunch of us decided we had a, had a, had a decision to make. If we're gonna go through this program and write a doctoral dissertation, uh, well, are we gonna work with Wagner or, or, or somebody else who will be tolerate this or do we have to go the mathematical economics route? And so, uh, and so some of us went that way and some of us uh, went the other way. Okay, and so in, in my research uh, was, was uh, obviously influenced by all this. Uh, some of my early uh, publications uh, one of my articles, it was in 1985 in the International Review of Law and Economics. I was studying antitrust at the time. And, uh, and of course, I was when, they, and when I was teaching, I was teaching the Austrian theory of competition, not the perfect competition theory of comp competition. 
And I had I noticed that I, all the textbooks said that in the, the in not late 19th century, there was a rampant monopolization of American industry, and that justified the antitrust laws, every single book. And I, I had a research assistant at George Mason, and I sent him to the library. Back in those days, you had to use libraries. You couldn't just go, there were no computers to, that you could use, or there was no internet. And, and, I, and I told him, bring back every book on antitrust. And then we, and find out anybody who has statistics on what was their rampant monopolization according to the, the mainstream criterion of output restriction? And the answer was no. And so, so we went, I went into Washington and, you know, to, to gather statistics because we didn't have them even in our library and on that. And I, and I go, so I got the statistics. I was the very first person to dig up the actual statistics on such things as production, production and prices of the industries that were accused of being monopolies by the, by the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives in the late 1880s before they passed the Sherman Act. And I published this article showing that, that instead of uh, output restriction, there was massive expansion. Now, these industries were the fastest growing and most, most productive industries in, in America at the time, which is why they were being picked on by their, their less successful rivals uh, who got the politicians to pass a law that would hamper them. And the same with prices. They, they dropped prices faster than the CPI dropped for 10 years prior to the Sherman Act and 10 years after the Sherman Act. It, it, same happened. And so and, and the, I, the only reason I was the first one to do that is that no one else asked this question from an Austrian perspective in, in, in the, ever before. Even the Chicago School. I looked up all the Chicago School antitrust books, and they all said the same thing. Uh, I, I, another article I wrote, I wrote that was similar to this, I sent to the Journal of Law and Economics, and Richard Epstein was editing it at the time, and it disagreed with something George Stigler had said. He had been praising the Sherman Act, and he sent me back a quick note. He didn't put the article out for review, and he just said, we don't criticize Nobel Prize winners around here. <laughs> that, that, was my, that was the review of my article that I submitted to the Journal of Law and Economics. So I was canceled, in other words. Yeah, it was a, it was economic cancel culture is what that was. Uh, then another, even though the, the whole rent-seeking literature, when I was at VPI, it was, it was the, the epicenter of all the early rent-seeking literature. Every, almost every seminar, they had two, two a week in the economics department. One was the public choice seminar and one was the economics department seminar. And most of them were all the literature being developed in rent, on rent-seeking, the economics of rent-seeking. And it started out by talking about you know, like such things as lobbying for tariffs is, is a, a waste of resources because the, 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 the resources used in lobbying could have, the opportunity cost is they could, you could use those resources to produce things rather than trying to seek an income transfer through politics. And, uh, and, so, and that was all good, I thought all the good. But then it sort of shifted and, uh, and the public, some of the public choice scholars uh, decided to become empire builders believe it or not, and they wanted to call such things as advertising, product differentiation, and R&D spending, rent-seeking, you know, the ingredients of competition. So I published another article in the International Review of Law and Economics called The Domain of Rent-Seeking Behavior and criticized that. And, uh, and I even used, uh, you know, Bob Tolleson, who was also one of my professors in grad school, and a colleague at George Mason. In an early article, he was quoting the Austrians on what competition meant. So I quoted his earlier definition of competition, which included advertising and product differentiation, because uh, 10 years later, he's writing articles saying this is rent-seeking. So uh, 10 years earlier, he's saying this is good, good uh, healthy competition. And then, uh, you know, after all this literature on rent seeking came about, he changed and started writing, calling it rent seeking. And I didn't, I thought that needed to be corrected. Uh, and uh, when, when Buchanan won the Nobel Prize, the editor of the Review of Austrian Economics was Chuck Baird from uh, California State University. And he asked me to write an article for the Review of Austrian Economics because I was a student of Buchanan in the public, public choice school and I'd been writing on Austrian economics topics. Also, and and the article that I wrote was uh, uh, Bu uh, the title was something like James Buchanan's uh, subjective subjectivist roots, and and I made the case that all of his best writing on on public finance uh, 
uh, is because of uh, his, um, his co subjective cost theory. He wrote a, a very good book called Cost and Choice. Uh, it's sort of a, a famous, you know, it's kind of famous Austrian literature. And in another book of essays that, that he edited on the, about the London, the London School, Lionel Robbins, I think, is a, one of his articles is published in there. And, and I made the case that, that his best work in, uh, in public finance and taxation, which he was very, very famous for at the time, it was cited when he won the Nobel Prize, was because of that. But, but when he wrote things that were not so good, it was because they were too neoclassical. For example, he wrote an article in the public, a Journal of Law and Economics making the case for the abolition of inheritance. And it was, uh, and it was not very, uh, and it was ob totally objective cost. There's nothing, nothing, nothing uh, subjective about, about that. And one final thing, uh, I'm going to run out of time, but I'll just mention Mises on the study of history also affected me a lot. And a, a couple of quotes from Human Action on Mises on the study of history. Quote, a mercantilist or neo-mercantilist must necessarily be at variance with an economist. <clears throat> that was always on my mind when I wrote books on Hamilton and Lincoln. Hamilton was a ignorant mercantilist on economics, and so was Lincoln. Lincoln was the political son of Hamilton. And so there was this, this and so was Henry Clay. So there was this, there was this political cabal in America that wanted to bring European mercantilism to America, Hamilton, Clay, and Lincoln, and they finally succeeded. And so, uh, and, and I, I was a history buff, too, as a hobbyist, and, uh, and so, uh, and I thought that a lot of this whole li literature and history was, I, think, I believe the scientific term would be ass backwards, I think, for, uh, <laughs> because it ignored this simple economic fact, and, and it sort of put a fog over the public's faces on um, what these people were about from an, on their economic policy. Another quote, subjective economics produces historical works very different from those based on mercantilist doctrines. Well, that that's, that's animates my books on uh, Hamilton and Lincoln and, and others. Another quote, history can never be studied without presuppositions and that non-historical branches of knowledge must determine the establishment of historical facts. In other words, a historian can, can look at the same facts that I look at and I, I, will, I will come up with a different interpretation of the meaning of those facts if I have an economic understanding of that. When I first started writing about Lincoln, for example, I wanted to know what his economic policies were. And I, and I, I was at the Smithsonian Institution because they had a, a lecture series there. I was living in Baltimore at the time, so I was driving to DC. And James McPherson, who was a, the most famous Civil War historian in the country at the time, Princeton, uh, um, I talked to him and I talked to others. What books should I read? Can I read where, where Lincoln's economic views? And they all mentioned this book, Lincoln and the American Dream. And so I went on got it by Gabor Borat. I went on got it. And it says things like uh, Lincoln was in favor of protectionist tariffs because he wanted ordinary Americans to have a chance to become wealthy like he had become wealthy. <laughs> ordinary log splitters like him. Yeah, like the 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 uh, lawyer general counsel for the Illinois Central Railroad splitting logs, and uh, and, and so, and that that's what that's what convinced me that I smell a big fat rat in, in this whole story <laughs> of that, and and so and it was just mercantilism is what it was, and so so if you have uh, Austrian economics and libertarian theory uh, in your educational background, you look at history very differently. And that means the following, the final quote I'm gonna mention from Mises in the Human Action, changes in the teachings of the non-historical sciences, like economics, consequently must involve a rewriting of history. So all good history is revisionist history, in other words. Now, from our perspective, if you have knowledge of economics and, and other non-historical sciences, that's how you interpret these facts. You know, the facts, you have facts about protectionism and the history profession, uh, being economically ignorant, says this is a good thing because Abe Lincoln said so, you know, in some speech, in some political speech somewhere. And that's, that's the, the, basically what they did. Okay, and so, so that's about, my time is about up. And, uh, and uh, thank you all for, for coming and participating. And no one has run out to go to be the first in line at the cocktail bar.
And uh, why don't we have a big hand of applause for the staff of the Mises Institute for all the hard work they, they've done. <laughs>